What is coming next? Now, the book of Revelation, the last book in this precious book, clearly reveals God's plan for the future. The book of Revelation begins and ends with a glorious climax of the coming of Jesus. In fact, Revelation chapter 1 and verse 7 indicates, Behold, he is coming with clouds, and every eye will see him, even they who pierced him. And all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him, even so, amen. You see, Revelation leads us to lift our eyes from the earth below to the heavens above. It leads us to lift our eyes from from the problems, the traumas, the disappointments, the challenges of life, lift them to God himself, who will send his son to solve the problems that you face, that the world faces, that the city of Indianapolis faces. You see, Revelation 1-7 clearly states, behold, he is coming with clouds, and every eye will see him. The last chapter of Revelation confirms the absolute nearness of Christ's coming. In verse 20 of Revelation 22, and you're going to get very well acquainted with that marvelous book, Revelation. In the 20th verse, it says, He who testifies to these things says, Surely I am coming, quickly, amen, even so come, Lord Jesus. And what a beautiful phrase that is. I hope as you leave this beautiful auditorium tonight, you will be saying in response to this message, even so come, Lord Jesus. Amen. You see, in Revelation 22, it says three times, Jesus says, in fact, if you have a particular Bible with red letter edition or those words that Jesus spoke, you will see three times in that chapter of Revelation 22, I am qu coming quickly, words from Jesus. The book of Revelation beats with expectancy, with vibrancy, anticipating that soon all the promises of God in Scripture will be fulfilled and Jesus will return. But there's a question. How quickly is quickly? How soon is soon? And how near is near? You know, haven't Christians down through the ages predicted that Jesus' coming was near? And haven't they believed that it was soon? Is there any evidence throughout the Bible that the coming of Jesus is actually near, literally, so that you and I might be able to see him personally coming in the clouds of heaven? What signs might there be from the Bible indicating such a nearness? Now, we're not the first ones to ask that kind of a question. The disciples of Jesus himself wondered what those signs were that pointed to his coming. And they came to Jesus one day, and they said, recorded in Matthew 24, what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? Now, in Matthew chapter 24, Jesus outlines, it's a magnificent chapter. If you haven't read it lately, I hope all of you have read it, but if you haven't read it lately, go back tonight, find your Bible, and read through it. It outlines more than 20 signs of Jesus' return. Now, in, a, in an absolutely masterful presentation by Christ, he blended the events associated with the fall of Jerusalem in the year 70 AD, which, of course, he was predicting 
because it wasn't 70 AD when he predicted it. It was earlier than that. And it also beautifully blends with what will take place at the end of the world. And he gave signs of his return that would be occurring in the world of religion, in the world of politics, in the world of nature, in the world of society. The first of these signs is in the world of religion. Jesus said before the end that there would be false Christs and false prophets. Matthew 24, and again, this is a very important chapter. I hope you will be focusing on it personally. Verse 24, for false Christs and false prophets will, will rise and show great signs and wonders. So before the coming of Jesus, this is very important, before his return, we should expect an explosion of interest in religious leaders who are leading people from the word of God and leading them into false signs, leading them astray in miracles that are not from God. You see, merely because a miracle takes place, it doesn't mean that the one who claims to have worked the miracle is working with God. There can be another source behind the miracle. The Bible teaches that evil spirits can perform miracles. The same book, Revelation chapter 16 and verse 14, for they are spirits of demons performing signs which go out to the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. So these false teachers point to miracles that they are doing as an evidence that what they are saying is true, but the signs will be demon-inspired to deceive men and women. They're counterfeits. The closer they get to the original, the more credible the counterfeit appears. But when you come to the very fact of looking at the original, you can see the counterfeit easily. Beware if any teacher leads you away from the Word of God. Beware. Now if someone comes to you and they claim miraculous signs and say they can heal the sick and if they re disregard the plain teachings of the Bible, be careful. That's why every meeting that you're being invited to here for this week we want you to write those texts down. Look them up in your own Bible. That's precisely why Bible texts have been put on the screen, so that you can verify what we are saying. We want you to see for yourself what is being presented is truly from the Word of God. I want you to study it out, and I want you to then follow God's leading in your life. Is that fair enough? All right. False teachers who lead religious cults are rising up around the world. In fact, in 1992, Shoko Asahara published a book declaring himself Christ, Japan's only fully enlightened master, and he also took the, the title, can you imagine, Lamb of God. You see, this gentleman claimed that he could transfer spiritual power to his followers, take away their sins and bad karma. Three years after this book was published, his followers released a deadly gas in Tokyo subway, killing 13 and injuring thousands. Some of you may remember that. In the last 50 years, there have been rapid increases in those claiming to be divine spiritual 
leaders. On the continent of Africa, a continent that I have spent actually about 17 years uh, living there, growing up as a young boy in North Africa, and then my wife and I and our family in West Africa. We love Africa. It is a beautiful continent. But everywhere around the world, we are seeing strange things that lead to destruction. On the continent of Africa, Joseph Kibwetere and Credonia Mwirindi led their cult followers to a fiery, fiery death. You see, this particular cult led to destruction. Jesus' words tell us to, an ex to expect an explosion of interest in the occult world, in psychic phenomena. And that's exactly what is happening today as Jesus predicted 2,000 years ago. Books on the occult are selling in the multi-millions. The number of books, magazines, movies, TV programs, and internet sites on the occult is exploding today. People are turning to the psychic seers and occult artists. The signs Jesus gave in the realm of religion are being fulfilled before your very eyes and mine. These false Christs, these false prophets, are a sign of the last days. The Savior then moves to the area of politics. You see, he discusses international conflict, war. Jesus predicts the very events we see occurring around us today. In that wonderful chapter, 24, verse 6, it says, and you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. Now, let's ask the question. Okay, Pastor Wilson, come on. Haven't we heard about all kinds of wars in the past and down through history? And, and, and if we've had conflict in these various centuries, does it make sense to say that war is a sign of the end of time? Well, let's carefully note what Jesus said. You will hear of wars and rumors of wars. It's in the plural. Verse 7, for nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. So Jesus predicted just before the end of the world there would be international conflicts on a global scale. In other words, there would be world wars. Having launched into the 21st century now, well into it, we can look back on the 20th century as the bloodiest of all centuries. One sociologist estimated in the 20th century there were 100 million deaths from war alone. That's a lot of people. The 20th and 21st centuries have been engulfed in the flames of war. Second Congo War, the war on terrorism, Darfur conflict, the Israeli-Lebanese conflict, Russia-Georgia conflict, Baluchistan War, Burundi Civil War. And I thank God Burundi is quiet now. Christians are being allowed to worship according to their conscience. I praise God for that. The Ivory Coast Civil War. It's a place where Nancy and I lived for about nine years. The India-Bangladesh conflict, Ethiopia-Somalia War, and so many others. And, as I've already mentioned, the Ukraine crisis. Pray for brothers and sisters in that area. Just think about the devastation in the country of Sudan as war has raged in that place and about the uncertainty of many African nations and the devastation that has taken place in Libya itself in North Africa, a place that I have visited as a young boy, a place that is a place of beauty, of the desert, 
but also of the seacoast, and yet there is confusion in that country. Of course, the Middle East is always a hot spot of conflict. Iraq and Syria have been devastated by war. Jesus' words are being rapidly fulfilled. World peace is very fragile, as you can actually ascertain, because the war in Ukraine is now affecting everyone and the economy. The Bible predicts that all human efforts to achieve world peace will fail. Some of you might say, what is the United Nations doing about the current war? Well, the Apostle Paul describes it this way. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 3. For when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them and they shall, what? Not escape. Not escape. See, a, a classic example of a peace treaty that was supposed to end all war is the Treaty of Versailles in France. June 28, 1919. It led to the formation of the League of Nations, which was the precursor to the United Nations. But of course, it wasn't very long before the worst world war in history, World War II, broke out. And this led to the formation, then, of the United Nations in 1945, after the demise of World War II. For all the best efforts of the United Nations, it has failed to achieve world peace. War has continued to engulf our fragile planet. Now, the Bible says, when they say peace and safety, then sudden, what? Destruction comes upon them. And we're seeing these prophecies being fulfilled today. I want to tell you, my friends, here in Indianapolis, a great city, a wonderful place, the Bible is so accurate. You can believe the Bible. It speaks to our day. The Bible says... Jesus would come at a time when the human race has the potential for world destruction. Never before in history has the human race had the ability or the capacity to destroy itself. Revelation describes it this way. The nations were angry and your wrath has come and the time of the dead that they should be judged and that you should reward your servants, the prophets, and the saints, and those who fear your name, small and great, and should destroy those who destroy the earth. So when Jesus comes to give out his reward, and you can read interesting account in Matthew 25, the next chapter, when he comes to give out his reward at a time when the, the human race has absolutely reached the capacity to destroy the earth, you can know we are at the end of time. You see, didn't the human race have the capacity to destroy the earth 100 years ago? No. They could destroy a lot of people, but not the entire earth. Today we have nuclear weaponry enough to destroy the earth multiple times. There have never been weapons made that have not been used. So Jesus said when the world would be gripped with fear, he would step across the threshold of time and eternity and he would come to deliver us. Luke 21, verse 26. Men's hearts failing them from fear and the expectation of those things which are coming on the earth. For the powers of heaven will be shaken. Now, when you're fearful, when you are anxious, when you are troubled because of whatever is facing you and the world, don't look around you. 
Look up, for the coming of the Lord draws nigh. I think I hear the footsteps of the coming of Jesus. All of history is moving towards a grand climax. And Jesus says, lift your eyes from this earth and focus them on a divine reality. Jesus says, I am about to return. Revelation reveals that there is hope. And therefore, the title of this week's presentations, Revelation of Hope. There are signs in the world of religion, signs in the world of politics, signs in the world of nature. The Bible predicts that all nature will be out of control just before the coming of Jesus Christ. You live in a beautiful area, but I might say sometimes in a dangerous area. You can expect tornadoes. You can expect fires, floods, hurricanes, and an epidemic of destruction that is ahead of us, not just for areas that seem prone to that, but for the entire planet. Among these natural disasters is the Bible's prediction for worldwide hunger and famine. Matthew 24, verse 7. There will be famines, pestilences, COVID-19, and earthquakes in various places. So we've had famines. We've been having people who have been hungry, hungry children throughout history. We've always had famines. But now one might ask, what's the difference? Jesus didn't predict a famine, but he said there would be famines, plural. Famines on an international scale. Hunger on an unprecedented scale just before his second coming. And as we look over this world, indeed, this prophecy and others are being fulfilled. The United Nations reported recently there is a severe food shortage in 38 of the major countries of the world. One sixth of the world's population will go hungry tonight. When you go to your supermarket and you find food and you satisfy your hunger, remember there are millions of people who will go to bed hungry. Thank God every day for the blessings he provides to you and to me. Amen. Experts, and don't forget to try and help those people. In fact, the United States is one of the greatest nations in helping other people, and may it always be that way. A feeling and a sense of generosity. Experts estimate that for two billion people in the world today, nearly one-third of the world's population, chronic hunger is ever-present in daily life. You see, Jesus' predictions about famine are coming true with uncanny accuracy. 10,000 people per day, 3.5 million people per year die of starvation. There are more and more people to feed and less and less food for them to eat. Drought in the Horn of Africa in 2011 resulted in the death of tens of thousands. Half the population of Somalia was affected by the famine. An estimated 260,000 people, half of them under the age of six, perished. Then Jesus said there would also be pestilences. In Matthew 24, verse 7, there will be famines, pestilences. Well, what's, what's a pestilence? Well, it's a strange disease that affects human beings, crops, and the environment. And they can result from natural causes or be triggered from carelessness by human beings. Matthew 24 says there will be famines and pestilences. This prophecy is being fulfilled rapidly. 
you see pesticides on crops. And here in the state of Indiana, you're a tremendous farming state. You know that the reason farmers put pes pesticides on the crops is because these diseases are destroying the crops. So pestilences are rapidly spreading in various parts of the world. Every year there are more than one billion cases and over one million deaths from vector-borne diseases, pestilences, such as malaria, dengue, dengue fever, schistosomiasis, human African uh, trypanosomiasis, uh, other diseases that are globally affecting millions of people. And of course, COVID-19 has outstripped just about everything. Literally millions have people, of people have died. Recently, 104 Nobel Prize winning scientists plus more than 1,500 prominent international scientists signed a document entitled Warning to Humanity. And they declared the following. No more than one or a few decades remain before the chance to avert the new threats we now confront will be lost and the prospects of humanity immeasurably diminished. Jesus said there would be earthquakes. Verse 7 indicates that very precisely. It is estimated that the world currently experiences 50 earthquakes a day or nearly 20,000 earthquakes a year. Since the turn of the new millennium, it is estimated that there have been over 800,000 deaths from earthquakes and related tsunamis, those great waves that are caused by the shock effect of those earthquakes. Uh, Luke 21 verse 11 indicates, and there will be great earthquakes in various places and famines and pestilences, and there will be fearful sights and great signs from heaven. <clears throat> this upheaval in nature would reveal itself in various ways. Hurricanes, typhoons, tornadoes, floods, fires would manifest themselves in rapid succession. Perhaps some of you recall that in eastern Australia, just recently, not too many, one or two years ago, there were terrible fires. And then just recently in eastern Australia, terrible floods from one disaster to the next. The news is full of disasters affecting millions of people. In just the years since 2001, there have been countless thousands killed, injured, displaced, and financially disrupted by fires, floods, heat waves, volcanic eruptions, hurricanes, typhoons, tornadoes, or drought. These natural desires, uh, disasters are signs of the return of Jesus. All of heaven, all of the universe, and certainly all of the earth is crying out, Oh, Jesus, come quickly. Amen. Hearts are indeed failing for fear, for anxiety about what is coming on this earth. And when you've seen an increase in the signs that Jesus foretold all around us, when you look at our world today, it does seem that nature is out of control. But those of you, of us, who have confidence in the word of God, believe these are signposts along the way pointing to Jesus' soon return. We've seen what the Bible says now regarding the signs of Jesus coming in the world of religion, politics, nature. Now let's look at social life around us. Our Lord predicted 
that the moral fabric of society would fall apart just before the return of Jesus. Moral decay and corruption would be prevalent everywhere. Verses 37 and 38 say, But as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. And it indicates that in those days, just before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage. You see, all of that happened just up until Noah entered the ark. Now, what's the matter with eating and drinking? Well, nothing. In fact, you're going to hear some great health lectures. Teeny Finley is going to be presenting. My precious wife, Nancy, will be presenting. They'll give you practical tips on living a healthy lifestyle. We don't get to heaven by being so super healthy that God says, well, I think I'll let you in. No, we keep a healthy lifestyle because our bodies are the temples of God. And our minds will be clearer if our bodies are functioning. Well, I'm getting into their lectures. I love health myself. So what's the matter with giving in marriage and marrying? Well, nothing. But this passage in Matthew describes a people who continued living self-centered, godless lives. They, 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 they took eating and drinking to an excess. Pleasure dominated their lives. And they ignored the signs of the times. Noah proclaimed, there you see him, preaching with all the power he could from heaven, he, po he pointedly said, a flood is coming. He pointed out the decay of morality. He, he indicated that this flood that was coming would be one that would wash the earth. And yet the people of that day stuck to their self-centered lives. They were not spiritually moved. They didn't repent of their sins. Their minds were too occupied. My dear friends here in Indianapolis, in the Warren Performing Arts Center tonight, don't let the devil distract you from what is important in your life. Amen. You see, people were enchanted with the here and now. And eternity was crowded out of their thinking. And what's happening today? As you look around, people are very self-centered. They're wanting whatever pleasure they can get out of their lives. And what's the result? The breakup of the family unit and a complacent attitude towards spiritual things and moral living. Do we see that happening today? The Bible model for the family is being shattered in modern society. Divorce and separation and failed relationships affect millions of homes every year. Children from fatherless homes are especially vulnerable to suicide, criminal behavior, drug dependency, behavioral disorders, being rape victims or rapists themselves, teenage pregnancy, and a higher risk of going to prison later in life. You see, the Bible's prophecies are being fulfilled before our very eyes, even tonight. But what a tragedy that love has degenerated into sexual immorality in so many cases. And what a tragedy that homes are breaking up. We can thank God that whatever circumstances you find yourself in tonight, even if you are one of those statistics that we've just looked at, God can heal your heart. God can give you a new sense of his love and care for you. He'll put his arms around you and he offers you a new future. Whatever mistakes you have made, 
whatever situation you find yourself in now, whatever bewildering, perplexing problems you face, God can forgive you and give you a new start. We live in a world of rising crime and violence similar to Noah's day. Genesis chapter 6 and verses 11 and 12 indicate the earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. So God looked upon the earth, and indeed it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. You see, in Noah's day, God destroyed the world with a flood because it was filled with violence. Is our earth filled with violence today? Is it a global concern? Yes. Are, are world governments concerned about violence? Yes. Well, most are. Yes, in 2014, the World Health Organization reported a shocking summary of the problems of global violence and the efforts to address them. 475,000 homicide deaths per year. One in four children have been physically abused. One in three women have been a victim of abuse. One in 17 older people have been abused in the past month. The Bible also predicts economic uncertainty as a sign of the last days. James chapter 5, verses 1 to 3, describe it this way. Come now, you rich, weep and howl for your miseries that, you are coming, that are coming upon you. Your riches are corrupted and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver are corroded and their corrosion will be a witness against you and will eat your flesh like fire. You have heaped up treasure in the last days. Revelation 18, verse 7. For in one hour, such great riches came to nothing. You see, wars have caused millions to flee their homes and become destitute, living in refugee camps. The number from the Ukrainian war at the present time is over five million refugees that have left the country. Stock markets have crashed, earthquakes, tsunamis, hurricanes, fires, tornadoes have destroyed homes, businesses, causing tens of millions of people to struggle to survive on very, very little. Jesus is coming. Amen. These prophecies are being fulfilled before our very eyes. Signs are being fulfilled. False Christs and prophets, wars and rumors of wars, cries of peace but no peace, famines, pestilences, earthquakes, sexual immorality, homes falling apart, violence filling our lands, economic uncertainty. The final sign that Jesus gives of his soon return in Matthew 24 is the gospel being proclaimed to the entire world. 14th verse of that wonderful chapter, and this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all nations, and then the end will come. This is a definite sign. Revelation chapter 1 verse, uh, 14 verse 6 echoes this thought as well. Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. So in Revelation, Jesus says, you will know we have come to the end by the final sign. When you see the gospel quickly going around the world in a powerful manner, you will know that this prophecy is being fulfilled today. You see, today, the gospel leaps across all the barriers through radio, television, internet. How many of you 
happen to have a cell phone. I think almost all of you. Many people now receive text messages and biblical presentations right on their cell phones. God is reaching people in every way possible. In a mountain remote village in Southeast Asia, a tribe receives a transistor radio. They begin listening to the short wave signal of Adventist World Radio, a Christian radio network broadcasting truth-filled gospel presentations. As they listened to the word of God, the whole village was transformed by God's grace and became Christians. In a wealthy Middle Eastern home, a Muslim family began watching Christian televisions. television. Their lives were changed, and they too now are on God's side. God is on the move. Prophecy is being fulfilled around the world. God is doing something special, my friends, here in Indianapolis. He is fulfilling his precious word. Amen. We are on the verge of the kingdom of God. Amen. The signs that Jesus himself gave to us are being fulfilled in a very calculated way manner. It is the midnight hour. And God is appealing to men and women, boys and girls, young people, everywhere, to you here in Indianapolis and right here in the Warren Performing Arts Center and to those of you watching on live streaming wherever you are in the world, God is appealing to you to be ready for his return. Amen. Tonight, how many of you would like to simply raise your hand and say, yes, Jesus, I believe you're coming soon. Amen. You know, Jesus is also asking you to be ready for his coming. If there's anything in your life tonight that might keep you from being ready for that marvelous second coming of Jesus Christ, it's time for you to surrender that to the Lord of Lords, the champion of love, as Charles sang earlier. He wants to save you. And not only you, he wants you to share with others because Jesus is coming soon. Pray. Father in heaven, we come to you tonight at the end of a lecture from your word, focusing primarily on Matthew 24, a wonderful chapter, a chapter that everyone needs to read and understand, that points to the signs, the many signs of Christ's return. And as we've gone over those signs, Lord, help those signs to have been impressed on the minds of everyone here tonight in the Warren Performing Arts Center and those watching through live streaming, that each one will say, yes, Lord, I see the nearness of your coming, for truly the midnight cry is going forth. Please, Lord. Use each of us to share with others this wonderful good news of hope. And also, you've seen the hands tonight, Lord. We ask that through the power of the Holy Spirit, you will lead us to accept Christ's justifying righteousness and his sanctifying righteousness, his grace from heaven above that will give us our ticket for eternal life. We lean upon you completely. Now, Lord, bless us as we depart from this Performing Arts Center tonight, filled with hope for the future. And thank you for the promise of Jesus' soon return. We ask all of this in the wonderful name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.